What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. This is episode number five, looking behind the scenes of the fantasy football industry. We've had some awesome, awesome, awesome guests on so far for the series. Um, from the feedback you guys have given me, you guys want me to continue. Thus, we're bringing another awesome guest that will not disappoint. I can promise you that. We have C.D. Carter, Denny Carter. You're going to have to kind of correct me and, and let me know which one you prefer of the two. Uh, C.D. Carter is the co-host of the Live in the Stream um, podcast with J.J. Zacharyson. He is also the founder of Draft Day Consultants, um, an awesome Awesome business idea that I was pretty jealous. I I thought I had thought of it first, but we'll get into that later in the uh, later in the interview. But he's been around the block. He has tons of experience in the fantasy football industry. He looks at things from a different perspective. I thought he'd be awesome to have on the series. He's also uh, an author in both the fantasy football sphere of things as well as some other genres that we'll get into. But um, CD, thank you so much for coming onto the channel. I'm super excited to have you and. Uh, you know, give give us a, a quick background, you know, of yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into the fantasy football industry and, you know, what you're working on right now. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me on, first of all. And, um, uh, you know, the name thing um, I feel bad about because uh, I've never given like a super straight answer on whether <laughs> I prefer CD or Denny. So okay. you're not you're not alone with that um, in my you know, regular life, I, I go by Denny. Uh, and, and I think most people on, on Twitter, like li living the stream listeners know me as Denny, but, um, I sort I like to write under the, uh, name CD Carter. So I'm, I'm not giving that up. I, I think I'm just going to have to confuse people, you know, for the rest of my time in, in, in the fantasy industry. Um, but, uh, you know, getting into a little bit about, uh, how I um, started. I didn't always have a small microphone that I that I used <laughs> to podcast, but that's it. That's maybe another story. Uh, uh, I started uh, in 2012. Um, basically, it was uh, a situation where I was deeply invested and interested in the game, and I wanted to write about it because that's when I'm interested in something, I write about it, and. Um, so I wrote about it, and I thought it was not the worst thing that I have ever written. So I submitted it to a few websites, and um, and it was picked up by the fake football. Um, it was uh, the first piece that I ever wrote was a, a story a piece on that Rams running back who was drafted to be Stephen Jackson's replacement back in the day, uh, whose name I can't, Isaiah something. Peed. Uh, shoot. Out. Anyway, you, but he's very memorable, obviously. <laughs> Clearly. Uh, yeah. So that's how I got started. And then, uh, picked up from there, uh, streaming defense article took off, uh, and then it sort of snowballed from there. Okay. Very cool. I mean, this is honestly perfect because this series, uh, I, I promised everyone that we would not do any player analysis. However, I believe the fantasy community has labeled kickers not players and i know that is kind of your specialty right so we might get into that later but we won't we won't touch on that now so uh kind of um i guess it was a passion turned into a um i mean not so much a job but i'm actually kind of curious because i mean i'm, I'm embarrassed to say I, I just kind of stumbled across you not more than a couple months ago so uh what you know, what kind of work are you in now? Are you full time? Like, are you, would you consider yourself a fantasy analyst? Would you consider yourself a, a writer? Would you consider yourself an entrepreneur? Or are you, are you just, are you 100% lib? 100% uh, <laughs> lib. <laughs> so <what> you said. <laughs> That's yeah. funny. As I'm 100% owned lib. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, but for the record, for my audience, this this is a funny motherfucker on Twitter. So if you're not following him on Twitter, you, you have to be doing that. He's one of the guys that does a great job of kind of intertwining his personality into fantasy analy uh, analysis as well as, you know, just the, the stuff he brings about his life onto Twitter. So definitely go follow him. I'll link that stuff down below. But, yeah, go, go on, yeah. please. Yeah, okay. Well, I I don't think I'm an entrepreneur. I, I, I sort of hedge on, on that label mostly because – I'm not I'm not great with with business stuff, but um, I consider myself a writer, uh, and 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 you know between I write books in the off season, um, I do a lot of in season work uh, in in the fantasy space. 
So I guess just generally, I consider myself a writer because I mean that's really what I, uh, what what I love to do. I mean it is it is what I've always loved to do, and it's why I started in the first place. And you know, you I never loved uh, writing fantasy stuff more than when I wasn't being paid for it, <laughs> which which is a weird thing 100%. that happens when you start getting paid. Then you seek out more more paying gigs, and then suddenly. Um, you don't like it as much, and occasionally you hate it. You hate having to do um, grind out a lot of articles in, in a week, but you know you're doing it for money, and who who can complain about that? So when I was writing for free, it was it was the most joy that I took from from fantasy football. As weird as that sounds, no, no, that's a good point. I want to touch on this because this uh, again, and I remind all the guests that come on here. Uh, a lot of this series is to uh, try to in- inspire and motivate the younger demographic because a lot of those uh, those people are the ones in my audience, right? And it's because fantasy football has built its audience basically through Twitter and through blogging and stuff. But um, I've been building my audience through YouTube, which a lot of the younger kids do. And I get a lot of questions about people asking me how to start a blog or how to start a YouTube channel because they see me doing it and things like that. And you, and you mentioned like once you start – getting paid for it, it kind of it makes you lose interest. Do you think that's from a creative perspective? Because I know that like being someone who needs to like be creative to be successful, like I'll have days when I only want to do stuff from like 6 a.m. to 12 p.m. or days where it's, you know, 6 p.m. to to, um, to midnight or whatever. And if you ask me to start doing work like outside of, uh, of my like, you know, those focus zones, it's it's like frustrating. You don't want to do that shit, right? Is that is that what you think of? Because I, I think of myself as more of a creative type, and as a writer, you definitely probably consider yourself the same way, right? I do, I do. I, I I'm a very what, what is it? Uh, is it right? Is it right brain that's creative? I don't, uh, I don't or know, left man. brain. But, but don't but don't, don't, don't fuck brain. it up though, because we're only bringing facts here. They'll call you out. We if only you're wrong. do big facts yes. uh, on this show. Uh, I. Uh, um, whatever side of the brain works on the creative part is is what I probably what dominates you know my um, you know thinking. But uh, I will say that that fantasy has forced me to become to to really use the the mathematical the analytical part of my brain, which is not is not natural for me. A lot of a lot of the people in in the fantasy industry uh, come from that perspective. They come from a data crunching hard number uh, uh, background and they're very good at it and they understand it almost innately and that's not that does not come naturally for me that's something I had to really work on and something that um, you know you talked about young you know young writers and and, and young people getting into the space I um, I would recommend uh, reading as many fantasy writers as possible and taking some of what they do and adapting it as your own. I, and this doesn't mean plagiarizing. Okay. <laughs> and, it, it, and it doesn't mean, you know, lifting stuff and uh, trying to uh, take someone's style. But um, a lot of, a lot of ways that people talk about numbers and, and break it down so that they're very understandable to the, to the average person, to the average internet, you know, content consumer uh, you can take that and and improve your writing and, and analysis in, in that way. Uh, I'm so sorry I've gotten off track and I forgot what the the, what the question was for no, this bro, one. You're, but, you're rolling. But anyway, the, I forgot the, what the question the, was too. The, <laughs> go 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 go. Yeah, the, the, the the writing. If you can combine that writing passion, if that's what you do, if that's what you have, uh, with the math part. Then you're 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 off to a great start with, with fantasy uh, analysis. Yeah, uh, I think that's a, that's a good point to try to, I guess, bring in different angles and 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 viewpoints uh, as to you know your own personal style. But I think that's like such a big thing that I see a problem with on a lot of younger people or a lot of people just trying to break through because you see you know for every C D Carter there are like. 50 million people trying to break through and trying to do their own blog or their own podcast that just never really get to that point. You know what I mean? So uh, I think it kind of goes back to a point you said, like writing is is your, you know, your first love and that's how you express yourself. And I think people need to be like super subjective and, and figure out like 
what's the best way that you can express yourself? Um, and I think for me, it was always like just putting a video camera in front of me and letting me fucking spew on for 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And I was able to break things down simply and, and quickly and in ways that people can understand it. And that's another good point by you is that's such a big part of this job because there's so much noise and analysis and stats that go into, you know, looking at fantasy football that if you can't like think like a fifth grader or break it down at the fifth grade level, then people aren't going to want to read what you're writing. So I think you touched on a lot of good points there. And now I forget what I was saying. So you look like you were about to say something. So jump in, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, that's that's a good point. You know, I think a lot of really um, intense, intensive analysis uh, goes under the radar because people struggle uh, to to translate that into, you know, regular how regular people think and talk, right? Yeah. And and that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate because a lot of work goes into that that number crunching and that analysis. Um, but it's it's also understandable because um, we've reached a level of sophistication in in, in the fantasy industry where uh, uh, people really sometimes need to have things explained to them in a very simple way, um, even the even those sophisticated. Uh, pieces those that sophisticated way of looking at the game um, that when I broke in into the space it was not like that it was just not like that 2012 uh, might as well have been 1982 um, uh, compared to where we are today with fantasy analysis and the and and that and that level of sophistication and the way it's improved um, so I I feel I honestly I um, almost feel for anybody trying to break in now it was much much easier when i was doing it in in, in 2012 far less saturation I, I know you know this uh this the fantasy industry is just saturated with with people with websites with options and that's that's not the way it was five or six years ago yeah that's that's exactly why a lot of these episodes i've been telling people like when they're like i want to start a blog i want to start a podcast i'm like sure but that's not going to get you anywhere. And you have to start thinking of things from a business perspective, from a marketing perspective, because, you know, everyone's going to be good, but not everyone's going to be able to get themselves out there and get their message across. Um, and when you're saying like great work can be undermined or not even, you know, get the attention. This is something I talked about with Josh, um, Josh Hornsby, because he, you know, he, he creates these tools. And a lot of the times they have all these abbreviations nowadays like pacer and racer and wins over adjusted yards adjusted for throwing quarterback attempts and i'm like dude like you gotta fucking chill like i i'm pretty well versed in most of the analysis but if it's over my head then it's over everyone in the main sh like you know people that just start picking up fantasy stuff now it's, it's gonna be over their head and he's like yeah he's like that's obviously something that i have to improve upon and that's for the number crunchers out there you have to make sure that you are well versed and i'm like dude if you're gonna start a blog why not start an instagram account on that why not start a youtube channel because it's like youtube right now getting into fantasy football is like getting into a blog when google's first search terms were happening like 10 15 years ago you know what i mean it's just like it's really thinking about it from an outside point of view and not so much just like oh my content is going to get me there and, and and put me over the edge on these things so um that's something that that these these kids have to kind of take away from this go on yeah yeah and and, and you have to uh <laughs> You have to separate yourself from the pack in some way, and and, and what I mean by that is that um, you're 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 going to have to do your typical articles, you know, undervalued quarterbacks, overvalued quarterbacks, you know, three people I'm going after on the waiver wire, this and that. I I've done those, we've all done those. Mm -hmm. It's it's part of uh, you know it's part of gaining traction in, in the industry, but at some point you need uh, to to give people a reason to give readers and and, and consumers a reason to come to you um, instead of go uh, somewhere else and 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 that's you know you mentioned kickers and if you don't mind I'll just <laughs> yeah, touch yeah. on that real quick okay. yeah and and you know uh, um, before there were a hundred streaming defense columns I wrote a streaming defense column um, I'm not saying it was the only one but it was one of very few and this is six years ago so. Um, and, and people paid attention and I gained a reputation somehow uh, for being the streaming defense guy. Um, and that, that was it. I, I only got questions 
about streaming defenses. And I was perfectly fine with that because I was the I became and this was intentional, the go to for streaming defenses. And I'm not talking about for millions of people, but for <laughs> a decent sized audience. For and you know, once yeah. once the streaming defense area got overwhelmed with content, I moved away from that. I went to tight ends, okay, and 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 that that lasted a short period. Anyway, I got I eventually landed on kickers as as a position that I I would really like to optimize and to become known for because for, I mean, but people don't just not analyze kickers; they hate kickers, yeah. and <laughs> and, and you know they. they <laughs> They shun them. They shun them. They it, for, for 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 many reasons. For many reasons, and s- some of those reasons are not you know grounded in in, in fact, in, but in some sort of weird animosity toward, <laughs> toward that position. Yeah. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, so that that's that's why I that's why I write uh, a weekly kicker column uh, during the season, and and I even do you know preseason analysis. As strange as that sounds, because that's part of separating yourself from the pack and you, you got to do that when you, when you can yeah that's a perfect example because you see guys separating themselves in, in certain ways like josh hornsby creating these different tools in these charts you have you know matt Harmon doing reception perception you have you streaming the kickers whatever it is like what you know if you think it's crazy then it's probably a good idea you know what i mean and that's true yes you're right and, and i'm sorry to interrupt but but one one question that you need to ask yourself when you're when you're when you're considering you know what what should I write or what can I write um, if you have a question uh, that 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 keeps popping up in your head as you're researching as you're reading about fantasy if you if you have this question continually come up you need to answer that question in in an article if you do the legwork and sometimes it's a lot of legwork it's a lot of data it's compiling always, always. to, to you know, to create to to create a good article. But if you can answer your own question in article form, then other people will read it. I guarantee you, because you're not the only person who's had that question. Um, so sometimes the best the best article ideas come from just your natural curiosity about a position or a trend or you know whatever it may be. Yeah, that's a good point because I mean, like people listening right now will be like, oh. You know, what can I do? There's nothing that hasn't been done, but just look at where I guess the industry is. Look, oh, Jesus, sorry. My uh, my text messages pop up in my top right on my computer, and they're always like super fucking embarrassing, and they go into my videos. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so people, um, right? So people are like, what, what can I do? And like, just an example off the top of my head right now, we see the trends that you know, Dynasty has been around for a little while, but it's it's gaining the mainstream, uh, and things like best ball, right? Like play draft is hitting, you know, enormous, enormous success. And while a lot of these platforms, you know, whether it's the Roto World and the Evan Silvers and those guys touch on best ball now a lot in their podcast, there will be guys who need to specialize in that. And you only look to for best ball, for instance, you know what I mean? That really break down the stats and be like, you know what, drafting two quarterbacks instead of three and drafting two tight ends instead of three is the reason why. And like someone will come out with the JJ Zacharias in like late round quarterback thing that that breaks off and, and like that's just an example but if you're trying to separate yourself think about stuff like that yes and all, that, that's a great point uh actually with the best ball i the, the the emergence of best ball analysis is really a great example of of the of that sophistication i, I hate to keep using that word i didn't plan on using that word a hundred <laughs> times during the show but um uh but but really I, I mean, there were there were seriously maybe three to five uh, best ball analysts on Twitter five years ago, and 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 they weren't writing articles; they were just answering questions on Twitter. So, mm-hmm. um, so that that that's a great example. Also, uh, speaking of JJ and you know his seminal work, his the late round quarterback book. Um, he cut against the grain of the industry when he wrote that book. Okay. This was the, the idea of the fact that you could get a late round quarterback was widely rejected at the time because we were just coming off of a season in which quarterbacks, you know, lit the world on fire. Okay. Uh, um, you know, that was the, the, the Matt Stafford year and so on and so forth. Right. Now, you know, people ignore that, 
Stafford in that season was a late round quarterback, but, um, uh, you know, but JJ cut against the grain of, of the industry. And, and so when you can do that, when you have a factually based reason to cut against, you know, popular perceptions and fantasy, uh, then, then that's the kind of thing that can separate you. Yeah, that's a hundred percent correct. And I just feel like um, even me, I, like I do tons of best ball drafts and I'll do mock drafts where I videotape and, or live stream my drafts. And, you know, for the most part, my analysis doesn't get much different than what my redraft analysis would be because I don't really have any facts or stats to back up really what I'm talking about when it comes to best ball. You know what I mean? So it's like as much as I can give you stats and breakdowns, like when there starts to be more like mathematical evidence or stats behind that. So someone in the audience right now become the best ball guy, send me some theoretical work on why tight ends or quarterbacks are better in these leagues or whatnot. And I will put you on my platform as big as I possibly can. And that's something we can work with. So someone do that, but yeah, that's a good point. And I want to kind of segue into um, you being the owner of draft day consultants and uh, kind of a a funny backstory to this. So have you ever read uh, this book right here by Jay Abraham? It's called get getting everything you can out of all you've got. I, I have not. Okay, okay. I, for some reason, I thought you might have because this is how I stumbled upon the idea. Uh, so I'm reading that book, and basically, it's like a business book, kind of. And I guess you said you're not a business guy, so you probably don't read too many of those kind of things. But um, you know, he talks about how when you are trying to be successful in an industry, you got to look at things uh, that people have done in other industries that have been that have worked, you know, and, and try to translate them into your industry. I'm like how can I do that in in fantasy football? Like, I don't know what to do there. And I thought of like, boom, like consulting that works in basically every industry does that. Right. And there's people that do that for a living. So I'm like, I'm going to take that and I'm going to put that into fantasy football. And I'm like, dude, this is amazing. I'm the first person to ever think of this shit. Like this is about to blow up. Um, And I go on Google and I type in fantasy football consulting, your website pops up and I'm like, Sam, like this is immediately went off. And uh, that's where I stumbled upon you. This was a few months ago when I, when I thought of the idea and, um, and ironic enough, I, I opened up a, a, like a calendar on my website for people to consult with me. Cause obviously, you know, I, I have like my own audience. It's not, uh, like big, like yours or some of the other guys, but the people who are like loyal to me will still rock with me and do that stuff with me. Uh, and I opened up my calendar to people for fantasy consulting. And about two hours ago, right before we got on, I had my first consulting call with, with a client, which is, uh, which is ironic that you happen to be the um the guest on my on my show tonight so i guess circling yeah. back to the whole the company um now you're the owner of it you are also the founder of it did you start it i want to hear the entire backstory your thinking your process like everything behind sure. it hit me, hit me with the big yeah, facts yeah. let's go i appreciate it i'm sorry you had to find out that way on google uh, <laughs> uh, but but congrats on, on the on the client um we so here's here's how it started and and i wish i wish it were some like epic or hilarious story, but, um, it's, it's not it. So in 2013, I think it was my, um, my cousin called me one night and was, was flustered and said, I have this fantasy football draft starting in five minutes. I, um, I don't know anything about really any players or teams. Uh, can you be with me on the phone while I draft my team? And it was late, and I didn't really feel like doing it. But he's my cousin. I said, <laughs> I said, okay, yes, let's let's do this. So, so the draft starts, and it's a it's a work league, and like a typical work league, people are not drafting optimally. Let's put it that way, okay? I mean, you could see Homer picks early quarterbacks, you know, defenses defenses going in the fifth round, yeah. kickers going in the sixth round. <laughs> it, just just a total disaster as far as you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> exactly, chef's kiss. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, uh, but and and so I, you know, I'm helping my cousin put together a team, uh, and and I'm not telling him what to do, but I'm suggesting here's what I would do here. Uh, this these players are still available. Let's let's go with with this receiver instead of that running back, whatever it was, right? And we come out with this just ridiculous team, okay? Just ridiculous depth at every position, and. It was because, you know, um, I he had me there to exploit these terrible, terrible decisions that his uh, fantasy opponents were making. Right. Um, 
but this is this is uh, not atypical of your average fantasy league. Just just really bad picks going on. Um, the problem is is that the people like people who are in these leagues don't know that they're bad picks, and you know they're susceptible to positional runs mm-hmm. um, where they just take a tight end because two tight ends went before them and they're freaking <laughs> out. Um, uh, just, just as an example. Yeah. But uh, so that so this experience with my cousin, you know, made me think. Well, you know, like like you like your thought. Mm-hmm. What if people would pay a little money to um, have me sit sit with them while they uh, draft? And so I started draftdayconsultants.com in 2014, and um, by that point I was fairly well established in the in the industry. I mean, not a huge name, but but I was out there uh, enough, and I had a great team, uh, and we have a great team today. I'm not saying that we don't, but our for our original team um, included Rich Rebar. JJ, Pat Thorman, TJ Hernandez, Jeez. Chris Raybon, just a just a murderer's row of fantasy analysts. Mm-hmm. At the time, they didn't have huge followings, and at the time, they weren't very widely known. But I I knew, you know, with each one, I knew that they were all going on to do would, would all go on to do big things because they were that good, and they were our first consultants, and they knocked it out of the park. Okay, you know, per- proverbial park and. And um, that's how that's how it got underway. Um, we have a lot of return clients, but we get new clients every um, every summer, uh, looking for a range of of, of services. Um, a lot of it is pre-draft consultations, so people yeah. will want to speak one on one with us over Skype or over phone. Um, you know, we sometimes use uh, smoke signals. To um, you know, to talk about pre, to talk about a, a draft strategy and how we're going to approach a draft. So, um, it's it's really worked out, and um, we've grown steadily over the past uh, five years. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, proverbially knocking out of the park. I'm not surprised. You got the fucking 27 Yankees lineup over there, man. That's a <laughs> that's a, that's a good squad. Um, and yeah, just to add on to other ways you can communicate, if you do end up having any younger kids come to you, 18 to 21, they love Instagram, so you guys can kind of just like each other's pick, go back and forth that way. You don't even need you don't even need to talk to each other, you know what I mean? So you can, you can keep it not face-to-face. Um, but yeah, I kind of want to dive in a little bit deeper because, you know, this is something very cool. Like when I first found it, like it was, it, it was just a couple months ago. So by this time, you already have, uh, I mean, every, every, <laughs> every Twitter profile I look at now is like, Oh, draft day consultant as well. So, like, I, I want to know when you started it. Um, how exactly, like, from I guess from like a business perspective, like, what did you say to these these bigger guys? I'm not like trying to steal you and bring other people on board. I, I'm just like genuinely interested. Um, you know, what were like some hiccups that you, that you ran across when you were building this up? Because the logistics sound tough because you have such a big team now, and you do have to look at it from a business owner perspective, right? Yeah, I think we have. I think we have. 16 or 17 consultants now um and we started with maybe eight so yeah it's it's grown um uh the i I think a couple hiccups one was the fact that in in the industry there seemed to be uh not great feelings about a consultation service (laughs) and i think those feelings ranged from people see it as cheating uh to you know you know, how big of an advantage can you really get? This is just a huge scam. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, was a little bit put off at the time. Um, but I'm glad that that those criticisms have, have died down over the years, but we're very upfront with people. We, we're not, we're not selling a miracle, you know, at draftdayconsultants.com where (laughs) that should be our, our uh, motto. (laughs) Um, but we, we, we don't guarantee championships, um, you know, we don't even guarantee playoff appearances, even though 85% of our clients last year made the playoffs. We still, we don't, we can't guarantee anything, right? Exactly. <laughs> Plug. And, and, and uh, 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 but, but we, we do promise to treat your team as our own. And each, each consultant that I bring onto the team, um, in short, my uh, standard is um, if I trust them to draft my team then i bring them on and and i and i do that through a talking to them and also b reading their work i read a lot of fantasy work 
I read a lot of work of people I don't know. I have no idea who they are. But if I if I come across a few articles by this person and it's very it's good and it's solid and I like it, I'll reach out to them and I'll say, hey, you know, do you want to be on the team? Interesting stuff. So so really, you didn't. Um, I mean, I guess you just came across a problem and you were like, this is going to be a solution to it. And I know you don't consider yourself a, a, like a business guy, but has that part become like a, a passion of yours or is it more like like it, are you like damn like i have all this shit to deal with like marketing and accounting and that kind of stuff or is that like how, how's that grown on you yeah that, you know that's uh well the marketing part is is a little bit natural to me because i got so used to marketing myself on twitter mm-hmm. um and you know that's I, you know i don't think that that's a a great um, I don't know, a part a aspect of our current, our modern society is, is the constant marketing of oneself, yeah. uh, because it kind of, you kind of turn yourself into a commodity. So I don't, I don't love that, but it was necessary to get noticed. And, and so I did what I had to do. Um, so the marketing part, the part is fine, but yeah, I mean, you know, the accounting, the business aspect, um, <clears throat> of, of, uh, I mean, just the record keeping, honestly, um, is something I don't I don't enjoy, but like again, you do what you have to do to keep it going, and um, you'll you'll be shocked really at, and I've been shocked at the at the um, way that you'll adapt, you know, to 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 what what has to be done, things that you know you're not interested in and you don't want to do, you end up finding a way because you want it to work, and I and I wanted draft day consultants to work. Yeah, that's such a good point, and and uh, I I don't remember who I was talking to, which episode it was about this, but I was I was saying I, I thought I think still now that the most important part of being successful, um, pretty much in a business endeavor, but in a lot of different endeavors in your life, is resourcefulness and just like figuring out how to do that. And in today's day and age, like there is endless information online. And if you want to, like, you don't have to invest money anymore. Like money is not the preferred capital. In my opinion, I think it's more time. Like you could learn anything as long as you are willing to put the time in. And clearly you're an example of that. Someone who's not super passionate about that part of the business, but you just figure that shit out. And I think that's super important because just get on Google, man, get on YouTube, search that shit, take a few hours out of your day to learn it. And you could learn any aspect of it. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I, as much as I disparage the internet on on Twitter <laughs> all day, uh, I I do think that the one positive aspect of the internet is that you can teach yourself some things, and that doesn't mean that you can become an expert. I don't. I really hedge to say, you know, someone can go online and become an expert in like, you know, how government works by <laughs> by reading online about it. I don't think that that's the case, but. But I think that you can, like I've gotten by, like you said, with just simple Google searches and 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 trusting, you know, I go to trusted sources to understand how to do the business side of it because that's just not really my my thing. But um, but I've uh, I've learned and and the internet is to credit, so that's a win for the internet. They, you know, you're welcome. <laughs> um. I- I just have a random question that just popped into my head. Uh, are, are you a, a watcher of Hard Knocks? You know, I'm not. I I don't. Uh, I I used to watch maybe seven or eight years ago. I, I just don't watch much TV. Uh, I, did, outside of outside of like of like streaming Twin Peaks on Netflix. <laughs> did you see? Did you see uh, Jarvis Landry going off in the wide receiver room? I'm, did you watch? That I video? did. Okay. Well. I don't want to be presumptuous, but I want your opinion on it. I feel like you, I don't know if you loved it, but I think you love the fact that so many people were triggered by it. Is that correct? <laughs> it, were, were they? Were people, were people put oh, off? Dude, yeah. Had, have you not been on Twitter after that episode aired? People were, there's this horrible leadership, like blah, 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 right back to the Browns way. And I'm like, dude, they really? needed something like that to get in there because Jarvis Landry just shook it up and people who are... 45 and and white did not like what he said in there and it was amazing <laughs> yeah right, right yeah well you, you know what it is and, and honestly uh, you know unfortunately when you you're not going to see that kind of reaction when you see a white 
veteran quarterback on the sidelines going ballistic, screaming obscenities at people. That's just you don't you don't, no one reacts that way. No one says, "Oh, this is this is terrible." They say that's leadership. You know that that's yeah. that's uh, that's that's a leader. That's a guy who wants to win. Um, but you know, with it, with Landry going off, and you saw it, you've seen it with De- Des Bryant. How many times have people destroyed Des Bryant for giving an impassioned speech on the sidelines? That yes, includes cursing, just like Tom Brady, just like uh, Dan Marino back in the day. My mm-hmm. God, Marino used to uh, curse a blue streak every time <laughs> uh, they they went three and out. Yeah, but um, but you know because because of of the race aspect, people see it differently. So unfortunately, you see that with Landry, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. I just <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. Like I don't I don't care about it. Like it's not like oh Landry, that was so awesome. Like you just changed how the Browns are going to do things, but. The fact that people get so caught up in it on Twitter is just like incredible to me. Yeah, and but um, I, it, from what I see, Jarvis Landry is more determined to change the culture of that team than anybody else, anybody in recent memory. Yeah, I agree with that, and I, I think it's I think it's an age gap thing too. Like I, I think most of the people that I saw going off about it on Twitter were probably, like I said, like forty five and up, and they just don't like seeing that kind of stuff happen on TV. And I think it even plays into um, the fact that we don't see a lot of those like older guys that are well-established in the industry really, um, I guess, moving their moving their audience around. Like uh, when I had Brad Evans, he was the last uh, person I had on for this interview. And he is someone who adapts really well to it, right? He's like a great video personality, but he blogs and he's like all over – um, he's all over the place, and, and he he's able to adapt to the change. And I think one thing you guys could do at Draft Day Consultant is maybe um, you ever thought of like video videotaping, maybe some of the the phone calls that go on, and, and put that up on a YouTube channel or something. Do you have any of that going on? Yeah, the, well, the, the issue with that is that a lot of clients want to remain uh, anonymous, <laughs> and so uh, you know it, we're we're not we're definitely not a service where where people go around uh, um, recommending us to, to friends and family members um, because they, uh, they want us to themselves. And I get it. I get it. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not mad about it, but, um, oh, yeah. but uh, the, the video, you're right. I mean, I think we could do more with video, whether it's, you know, videoing a live draft with, with consultants. Um, I, uh, I have to admit that I'm not, super tech savvy <laughs> and uh let's put it this way nick you won't believe this i don't have an instagram account i believe it because nobody that does fantasy football has an instagram account and that's why i'm on it and that's why i'm going hard on instagram because nobody else is doing it bro that's where there i'm at go. right now um no yeah what you should do is just this is what i did because my first call tonight i realized that like i would like to um put that onto my youtube channel as like an example to kind of market myself And I think it it like just if you guys have like a questionnaire you fill out, you should just throw in like a yes or no checkbox. Like, would you be okay if we um, videotape this for marketing content? And like 99 percent of them will probably say no. But the ones that say yes, I mean, that's kind of all you need. Right. right? I think that's something that you guys could throw in there. That's true. That's true. Um, We have a page where we keep track of, um, you know, client feedback. Um, and uh, but but that's it's sort of old school uh, in that there's no audio or video. Um, uh, we could we could definitely improve on that aspect. I appreciate the idea. Yeah, man. Of course. We're all trying to eat out here. Everybody, man. Yeah. Don't mind sharing. <laughs> um, but I think I mean, like what you guys do marketing wise, it's it's since you have such big personalities there, it's almost like you're using yourselves to be um, be influencer marketing or, you know, influence influence an audience into what you guys are already doing. So it's not like you need to really be a marketing wizard when you have that kind of audience. Cause I, I, I kind of say a lot on this channel that, um, you know, besides the point that money is not like the, the main source of capital time, investing time is big, but, um, having an audience is something, you know, if you have an audience, you could always turn that into revenue, but you can't buy an audience with revenue. So I think like you guys have that set up in, in like perfect fashion, um, that you can use in your favor. I just think it's all about getting content out because, you know, a lot of you guys probably are older and aren't on the marketing side of things. So, they, you know, content is king, as you know, but it, it's varying the different types of content to hit the different audiences. 
Yeah, yeah, it's uh, you're, you're right. It is e- it is easy to get the word out because we have a really good team uh, that uh, you know some, most of them have have uh, have a decent following. Some of them have have large followings, um, so that's that's sort of built in. But but you're you're right. That's a good point. Um, before you, before you can you know sell anything, you need an audience, and I know I know that. Uh, it seems like a catch 22 because it's like, well, I need to sell stuff to gain an audience. Um, but okay. you, yeah, that's not, that's, that's not how it works. And I know you know that. Yeah, no, it's all about giving value. So once you start giving good value, people will be like, yeah, we love you. We'll right. follow you. And you keep giving them value and free value and free value. Eventually you build up the audience. And then it's like, I don't know if you follow Gary Vaynerchuk, but he's, a guy who always says like jab, 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 and then right hook. So it's like giving tons of free value out. Those are the jabs. And then when you're like, oh, here, buy this or buy that. And in the industry today. Yeah, I have a book. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. Fantasy football analyst. But here, I just started making calculators. Buy, buy one of my shit so you could do your draft better. Like people would buy that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? So there's there's a lot of different ways to, to make revenue here. And I think people are probably stuck in the old mindset of, um, like when I had James Coe on, he's someone who went to school for journalism, got his um, graduate degree in journalism, went a very safe path and, uh, you know, is on it, like salaried worker that, that writes and is a sports reporter or whatever. And there are just a million different ways to do it. And you are like a living example of how you turned a draft day consulting business into revenue. And people need to keep their eye on the prize of that stuff. Like it is a passion of everyone that's in the industry. And we love giving out content for free and helping those people. Um, but for the amount of time and work that goes into this, you know, you do like to see a tangible return. And that's like one of my main points to take away here for the younger audience is like always be thinking creatively and always be thinking outside of the box, um, no matter how crazy it sounds, because everything, everything initially sounds crazy, like until it's not, you know what I mean? So it's just, yeah. it's, it's always thinking that way. I, I, uh, I have to say, uh, you, you, you joked a second ago about um, selling calculators uh, um, okay. I don't know if you're aware, but in December <laughs> I sell wall calendars <laughs> and, and I, and I, and I, that's not, this is not a gag. I actually sell wall calendars to people on Twitter, um, based on a series of tweets of rise and grind tweets that I've had over <laughs> the years. And I put them on uh, a calendar and I have a very good artist uh, you make up some some images and photos to go along with uh, with the with the rise and grind tweets, and people like them and people buy them every year. And so the, I didn't you know I didn't intend I didn't say you know when I grow up I want to buy I want to sell wall calendars, but people <laughs> bought people bought wall calendars from me happily, and I was very happy they did. Trust me. Uh, uh, and I'll lie, I'm just a fantasy writer, so it's weird how that works. That's amazing. Where can we find these wall calendars? I want to look them up really badly. Uh, you know, um, I, I had to make sure that the site is up right now. It's uh, okay. You can find it. I can edit at, this out if it doesn't work. Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's it's a long thing. Sites.google.com/slash rise and grind there yeah rise and grind hell yeah are these um (laughs) i'm I'm stumped right now (laughs) these rise and grind guys that's that's amazing so we have an author we have a salesman a businessman a fantasy analyst a man of of many many different ventures and successes i sell coffee mugs too coffee mugs seriously (laughs) people people buy coffee mugs and you can find it at that site and uh uh, it's so the coffee mug says, uh, <laughs> rise and pour enough coffee down your gullet to feel temporarily alive and grind. Uh, and, um, Roto grinders, uh, sponsored the mug. And so we went with it. <laughs> That's hilarious. I, I don't know. This is, we, we, we live in a computer simulation and I sell mugs and, uh, uh you know, wall calendars. It's weird. I, dude, I'm with you, man. Because like, when I started, that was never my intention to start selling random products, but now I make shirts that say shit like big facts only on them, and I sell them on my website. So it's funny that's how that's a good that, shirt. Yeah, you know, it's funny how that stuff works, and I think that's I think that goes to um, say about how like 
you you build you know you build this audience around your brand like people people follow you because they like you and eventually they start catching on to things that you say and um you know different phrases or, or artwork you use or different whatever it might be and then you kind of turn that into something that you can monetize the same way you did it with the rise and grind i'm assuming you had a a, a, a ton of like humorous rise and grind tweets that people loved yeah 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 right right that's how it started i i i started to mock uh the you know ri hashtag rise and grind twitter um with <laughs> with these you know sardonic and sarcastic uh tweets about rising and grinding and and people picked up on it they 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 seemed to really like it and but i was doing it for me yeah. i was doing it because i i enjoyed it i liked writing those i found it funny I didn't intend for it to be anything. I ended up writing a book uh, called 96 Ways to Rise and Grind. Uh, and I have coffee mugs and a wall calendar. So, you know, brand, 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 I guess. No, nah, man, that's that's really what today's branding is. And it's just like you have to be yourself and you have to be 100 percent authentic when you're building out your brand and trying to build something successful because, you're going to burn yourself out trying to be something you're not. And like a lot of the things I say in, yeah. in my videos or in my blog posts or whatever are sh things that I would say had I not been doing videos or blog posts or things that I would say with my friends. If you watch my Instagram stories, it's like the dumbest things you will ever see. But those are things I say in my videos and people are like, that's kind of funny or I relate to that because it's so dumb. You know what I mean? And that's like <laughs> that's what building a brand really is in, in 2018. It's just like about being authentic for real. Yeah, yeah, it has to be real, and, and, and people can sniff that out, though. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it, people are not dumb. They they can tell when you're not being authentic, or or when you're really forcing something, you know, to be a thing. And um, but if you are yourself, um, then you're more likely. I'm not going to say you're guaranteed, but you're more likely to find some, some success if if you are yourself. I will say that. Um, in my experience, and I'm sure maybe probably in yours, uh, not everybody is, is an interesting person in, in that sort of public way. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's not, it's not for everybody. Like, like creating a, a brand online is not for everybody. Um, because it's just not conducive to some personalities. Now, uh, it, it works for, for me because, uh, I, kind of grew up in the like basically okay i think you're, of twitter fun, as the high school dude. hallway that's why it works okay in the in, in the high school hallway you're peacocking you're trying to get noticed right and so i i i'm not you know i'm i'm accustomed to that i, I over my life i've become accustomed to that so twitter felt very very natural for for me <laughs> to do that and it's obnoxious at times it's a, don't get me wrong it you you sometimes find yourself looking and being obnoxious, but that's the nature, I think, of social media sometimes. And honestly, not everybody hates it. Not everybody hates that sort of personality, I, I have to be honest. No, I, I think it's like the more you stay true to yourself, like the more extreme you are, whether like your true personality is being obnoxious, like the people that don't like it and the people that hate it will really dislike it, but the people that follow you and the people that like it will be so, so loyal to you. Yes, that's right. That is right. And it, it's it's only when you try to be all things to all people that that you fail. You cannot be all things to all people. You if you have a polarized and, you know, in fantasy, it's a little different. And, and so I don't want to emphasize that too much. But if you do something that makes some people really not like what you're doing, and, but but a lot of people enjoy what you're doing and 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 tr and track it and follow it. Uh, then then you've then you've be, then you have a chance to become successful. But don't try to do everything. It's like uh, it's like a movie star who also records albums, uh, <laughs> who also appears in at TV shows and does a little bit of everything, but kind of sucks at everything. You know, instead of focusing on one thing and 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 being really good. This is not, by the way, this is not smearing uh, Dwayne the Rock Johnson. I, <laughs> I know, I don't, He's, I don't want the Rock to be mad. No, at me I want to talk about the Rock. I that. want to talk about the Rock for a second. Now that you bring him up, he has to be like the worst actor I've ever seen. But his movies make so much money worldwide. You know what I think it is. You know what I think it is is because 
None of the no, you never watch a rock movie and like you see an ex- absurd amount of action going on. It's always like guns and, and and tidal waves that are like 200 feet high. So he does so <laughs> well in international movies because they don't know what the fuck is going on. They don't understand what he's saying. They just see all these explosions. It's out of control. He's isn't he the highest grossing actor in the world? Yeah. He he strikes me as a guy who can do literally anything that he wants to do. I mean, what I mean by that is like. If he sets his mind to it, he's going to do it. He just seems 100%. like that kind of guy. And that, you know, that's admirable, but it's also not really uh, doable for, for 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 most human beings. He seems not to have limits, I have to be honest. <laughs> I know. It's like if you follow him on Instagram, it's it's literally like just uh, just woke up from a two-hour nap after filming for, for eight hours. I'm just going to grind out 32 sets of deadlifts, and I'm like – rock like you're inspiring but like fucking relax my guy like oh my god yeah can, can you sit down <laughs> rock please yeah i mean it, like, do your best I mean, rock the, the, guy, the guy works out doesn't he work out four hours or six hours a day I don't, like like, how does he even do all this other stuff i don't understand it makes no sense I, I i don't i really that sort of motivation is alien to me i'm, I'm not i'm not an unmotivated person uh, but i'm not, i'm not on that <laughs> level yeah, he gives a lot of like physical motivation. And I mean, I guess I don't I don't really know who that motivates, to be honest with you, because that I don't know how that can get you going, really. But um, I guess to kind of segue out of that into the last thing we say, because we like to leave the audience with um, actionable advice, again, probably for the people trying to make it in the industry. But again, we touch on a lot of topics that have way more to do with really like anything in life, business, um, relationships, like anything like that. So I will leave you with that question. Do we have some actionable advice for these people outside of watching The Rock on Instagram? Yeah, uh, that, that's basically it. Watch The Rock on Instagram <laughs> and log off. And, um, and watch the cash flow. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, said, <laughs> says the guy who doesn't have an Instagram account, but I know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I would love to – to come up with, with something, uh, uh, brilliant and, and new, but just to repeat, you know, what we were talking about earlier in the show, uh, separating yourself, giving re giving people a reason to remember your name and remember where you're writing and what you're writing is something that's, you know, critical. If you're going to have, uh, you know, long-term success, everybody, you know, not everybody, but a lot of people can, can write one article that gets noticed in the in the industry, um, but it's a matter of of gaining a a loyal, like you said earlier, a loyal following, a loyal a loyal readership who will then eventually buy coffee mugs from you. <laughs> so, as, as as nuts as that sounds, right. um, if you if you can separate yourself by first of all question everything, uh, question every. Uh, you know, wide held, widely held belief in fantasy football, um, and really drill down on on those questions and the questions that you have for yourself. And if you do that, then you can produce stuff that other people uh, will want to read. I, one last thing: um, this goes for all writing, um, not just fantasy, but all writing. If if you are not interested in what you're writing you can't expect anybody else to be interested. So keep that in mind. That's an awesome point. And I actually have one more question I wanted to squeeze in. I remember I sent you it over on the on the uh, list and I was like, I don't know, actually know if this is going to come up or when we're going to squeeze it in, but we're going to leave it for the last question. Since you are an author and you have actually put out real books outside of, um, you know, blog posts and stuff like that. I- I'm uh-huh. curious as to what is your writing process like, just from like an author's point of view, because I, I don't know how this works. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, for the, um, how to think like a DFS winner, uh, just for, for an example, which I wrote a few years ago. Um, what I did was I read, um, I read books about poker strategy and I try and I tried my best to translate that, that poker advice and strategy into, uh, a, a sensible way to approach fantasy football using, using the thinking of a poker pro and I, and I, and I, and I interviewed poker pros, um, and read their books and, and read their magazine articles. And, um, and then after I did that sort of research, I, I had, you know, I laid out the chapters that I wanted to write 
And then at some point you have to put pen to paper. You have to, you know, look at that blank, that horrible, horrifying blank screen and, and just start writing. I, I, the, the, the best way to start writing is to start writing. And, that, and, 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 and that sounds really basic, but, but you'll find it to be true. And with the books, with the um, how to think books, which you can find on Amazon, uh, mm-hmm. uh, those that that really happened because I just kept writing uh, about the research that I had done, and mm-hmm. eventually I I had a book. It was a very weird process, but it but it ended up uh, the, to be one of the most satisfying things I've I've done. That's awesome. That's uh that's really that's interesting. The amount of work and time that goes into. Um, you know, the background of these things, because I don't think a lot of people realize just how much work it probably takes to do that. Um, so having wrapped it all up, you heard the man, his actionable advice outside of following the rock, which he doesn't even do himself. So he was not actually giving you big facts the entire time. Don't know if we could take any of his word for anything, but uh, CD, I want to say thank you so much for joining me, man. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm sure my audience will love this. Um, why don't you, you know, plug your plug all your stuff yeah. back in there, and I'll link everything <laughs> down below as well. So where where can they find the man? Sure, sure, and thank you for having me on, Nick. Uh, yeah, it's uh, at CD Carter thirteen on on the twitters, and uh, <laughs> uh, DraftDayConsultants.com is the website, um, and then Living the Stream is the podcast that I do with JJ Zacharyson every uh, Tuesday. Uh, we're gonna we're starting uh, this week. Uh, we're starting tomorrow, which is which is Wednesday. And then during the season, we do the podcast on Tuesdays. You can find that at LateRoundQB.com. Okay, so you heard the man. Go follow him on Twitter. Go check out his website for Draft Day Consultants. And he's got the two podcasts up and going. Uh, By the time you guys watch this, those will be live already. So make sure you go do that. And uh, thank you all for joining us today. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. And we'll see you all on the next episode. Goodbye.